Welcome to the Brownstone Trail or Lake Superior Shoreline uh, Inventory Study Presentation. I'm Erica, I'm the Conservation Manager here at Landmark Conservancy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn our meeting right now over to Bill, who is the Chairman of Landmark Conservancy, and he's going to welcome all of you and then turn it back over to me. Take it away, Bill. Okay, thanks. Well, welcome everyone on this cold day and uh, just a quick uh, note about myself i actually love the cold and the snow for a couple of reasons but the first is i i made swiss miss hot chocolate for 35 years and we always sold more hot chocolate when it was cold and snowy so i just happen to love uh love cold weather <laughs> but i also love uh outdoor recreation and if if you uh, uh take a look at why i volunteered and why many people volunteer to work on conservation projects because you love outdoor recreation and I know myself, uh, every day is a little special if I can go for a hike, a ski, a, a bike ride, it just makes, just balances one's life out. And of course, that's that's why we volunteer to do what we, what we do with uh, Landmark Conservancy. I can tell you, you know, the Brownstone Trail, which is why we're here today to talk about the uh, the great work that Tom Fritz and his Northern College students have done and, and, and potentially next steps that we can, we can take to help support this trail for our Landmark Conservancy Board, it's of utmost importance. It's, it's, it's something that we, we really are committed to, to helping to find a way for the long-term management of the Brownstone Trail. It's something we feel very strongly about. Um, so that's the, really the little quick introduction I wanted to, to make and to thank everyone for being here. And I'm gonna turn it back to Erica. So welcome everyone. Thank you for your time tonight. I know everyone uh, is busy recreating. Uh, it's just, a, it seems like it's a busy time of year and winter doesn't get any less busy anymore like it used to. So beautiful birds, the migratory bird season is upon us come May, hopefully even maybe April. Um, purpose of our meeting tonight, our meeting tonight is really going to focus on the shoreline inventory study um, that Tom Fitz is going to be reporting on and taking up most of the time tonight uh, with his results and his findings. We're going to give the brief overview of the Brownson Trail and shoreline stewardship, especially those that are new um, to this area or maybe aren't super familiar with the Brownstone Trail, or just a reminder for folks that are familiar. Give a very quick uh, update about the status of the current slump project, uh, what we call uh, the slump, <laughs> slump location, slump project and then shoreline the shoreline inventory um, study results, and then we'll discuss the next steps for those areas of concern. So this is just who's gonna be speaking, and again, this will be on our website, and I will introduce folks as, as we go along too. So a little bit about the Brownstone Trail. As all of you know, it's a very popular, uh, probably maybe the, the most popular trail in the Bayfield area. It's a very beloved trail. It travels along the shoreline of Lake Superior and this lake shore provides important wildlife habitat, like for those migratory birds that I showed earlier, scenic views from the land and water, uh, natural views for the folks that live along the trail. And then as well as this lakeshore also supports the very trail that all of us uh, walk and bike and ski on. Um, this map shows the location of the Brownstone Trail and it's a major artery as you all can see of the Bayfield area trails uh, network. It connects other areas and their trails to each other. Really going uh, into the future, we'll be connecting Mount Ashawa Bay to the Salmo Trail, and you can learn more about that through the Bayfield Area Trails Group. And then obviously to the Brownstone Trail and then to the Big Ravine and then all beyond to Red Cliff in that area. So it's really a major artery and we very much recognize um, its importance. Unlike most areas, uh, most area trails though, the ownership of the trail is a little unique. It's primarily private and, and Tom Fitz will be showing you a map a little bit later. So it's pretty unique in that sense that it's really privately owned land that this trail um, crosses over. So recreators can access the trail though through trail easements. Those are granted by landowners. They are held by Landmark Conservancy, our organization. 
And through these trail easements, um, everyone always asks, well, what does Landmark have permission to do? And really those trail easements only give us permission to steward the actual trail itself. And so if y'all are familiar with the trail, sometimes that's a five foot width, sometimes that's a 10 foot width. And that's, that's, that's pretty much it. We don't have that jurisdiction to work beyond this area on, on those private properties. So while doing activities along the trail itself are pretty straightforward, um, laying gravel and, and that type of stuff, managing what is affecting the lakeshore and ultimately that trail is more complicated due to the owners and due to all the different types of land use that occur on those adjacent properties. So over the years, as you all know, Landmark's role has really been working with the community members and volunteer network to keep the trail in, in good shape, whether that's renewing the easements uh, that are, there's a few that are not permanent, uh, just so everyone knows that, fixing the wet spots, laying gravel, controlling invasive plants, so the wildlife stays uh, healthy, uh, doing signage and that type of thing, that's been our, our main focus. And then over the last few years, coming to my third bullet point, more major issues have been observed along the lakeshore, uh, really looking at the stability issues and what is happening um, along the lakeshore. And that's why we're here tonight to learn more about that. Since 2019, as all of you know, Landmark Conservancy, we've been working hard on addressing one of these areas of concern, and that's that slump that is occurring on Landmark property um, that's adjacent to the Mackey property. We've owned that Landmark property since 2019. And we had a community meeting uh, that many of you were at, thank you, um, in 2020. And after that meeting or at that meeting and then subsequent discussions, we really identified the best solution um, to be the purchase of the Mackey property to restore the slope, be able to locate the trail in a stable location, and then provide a more natural space for the community as well as a public access point uh, to the trail. And at that meeting, community members also shared a really strong desire to make sure the trail is around for a long time rather than looking at shorter term solutions. Folks really want to spend funds and resources wisely and Landmark very much agrees uh, with that approach. So taking all of that into context, why did we do the shoreline inventory study? You probably all kind of know why we did that. <laughs> So we participate in, as I mentioned, the Bayfield Area Trails um, group. And we've been having a lot of conversations with those partners about long-term trail health for all of our trails and how to move forward toward achieving that. And I wanna recognize Kate Kitchell, who is the current chairman of that active group. Um, she's been part of these discussions and she really helped seed the idea for the Brownson Trail of the need to do the shoreline inventory. We really want to understand what's affecting the Brownson Trail beyond just the current slump location. Uh, what's affecting it now? What can we expect in the near future and in the further distant future? We want to learn where erosion is occurring, where are their pinch points, where are their active slumps, where are their drainage issues, where are their old culverts out of the dozen or so culverts that go under the trail. And then which of these areas of concern need to be addressed and when? We really wanna use this information to help guide the collective Bayfield community of all of us together to work together to care for this community trail, this community asset. So this evening, we've invited you to gather with us uh, to learn, um, from, learn about the shoreline inventory study that was led by Northland College um, and Tom Fitz, a geology professor there. So that's our main purpose of our gathering tonight. So hopefully you're still with us. <laughs> so I wanna recognize before I just turn it over to Tom, just a few of the Bayfield area, um, or excuse me, the Brownson Trail partners. Um, these folks have made the study possible and, these, and some of these folks just also continue to make the work along the Brownstone Trail um, possible. So for this study, I just want to just quickly mention a Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation um, funded a grant that Northland College submitted for this study. And then uh, we are, we've engaged with Northland College, obviously, and then we continue to engage with Smith Group as a recognized firm. They have experience working along the Great Lakes on projects like this. 
uh, and they've been helping us analyze results in creating and will be working with us to create designs for solutions. So you're going to hear from Chris tonight also, uh, just briefly, from Smith Group. He's a coastal engineer. And now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to turn it over to Tom Fitz, who's going to present the Shoreline Inventory Study. Hello, I'm Tom, and I want to thank you for coming to this important conversation this afternoon and for your interest in the future of the Brownstone Trail. All right, this is the outline for my portion of this afternoon's presentation. First, I'm going to talk about the, I'm going to give you some background information about why we have done this study. Next, I'm going to tell you about the setting, um, the geologic setting, the physical setting, the biological setting. Um, then I'm going to address the challenges that we face that Erica alluded to with the slumps. And then I'm going to end with some final thoughts about the Brownstone Trail before I turn it over to Chris to discuss possible solutions. And then we'll have the community discussion at the end. Okay, so the Brownstone Trail, as Erica said, is located in northern Wisconsin on the east side of the Bayfield Peninsula with uh, beautiful views off to the east towards Madeline Island. The trail extends from Bayfield in the north. Uh, it is 2.2 miles long. I'm gonna get my pointer here. Okay, laser pointer, 2.2 miles long, and it ends down here at Port Superior Marina. Um, there are eight public access points along the trail, and uh, it connects different uh, neighborhoods along the shoreline. It's, it's a pleasant hike um, through the woods, and it is along the shore, enjoyed by many locals and visitors, and um, with a connection to nature and getting out uh, for a walk and um, connecting the different neighborhoods as well. Okay, the reason that it is on a gentle grade is because it was put on a railroad grade, okay, a railroad grade um, that was created in the 1880s, and the railroad um, brought uh, lumber away from Bayfield and rock, the brownstone from Bayfield and brought passengers in. So that's why it's a level grade because the railroad of course had to be um, uh, fairly, fairly level. Okay, so the railroad is created in 1883, right? And it was used continuously from 1883 until the late uh, 1970s when the railroad stopped running. And at that time, the land was um, divided up and sold as individual parcels to private landowners. And then in 1996 is when <clears throat> um, Bayfield Regional Conservancy, which merged and became Landmark, um, obtained easements. I'm going to move this out of the way here. Okay, obtained easements um, to create the Brownstone Trail. That was 1996. And now here we are talking about the future of the Brownstone Trail. So since 96, it has been a beloved uh, community asset. Okay, so as we mentioned, the uh, land is since the 1970s, um, it is mostly privately held, okay, uh, private landowners. There's a little bit of public land in the north and the section that was recently donated to Landmark Conservancy. And this is an important point, as Erica mentioned, because you know, maintenance of the trail falls on, it's, it's, a, it's the community um, responsibility, really, we have to work together on this. Okay. <clears throat> um, today the land around the trail is, is a mix of forest, it is rural residential neighborhoods, and a small amount of uh, commercial land. Okay, this is a, this historic aerial photograph from 1976 shows the railroad grade right along there like that. Okay, this is just south of Bayfield, about half a mile. And this actually shows one of the properties that we're gonna be talking about um, this afternoon right there. Okay, so it had been, as I mentioned, it's been in continuous use as a railroad grade and maintained until about that time, okay? And the forces of erosion um, have continued. Okay, so nature is, is working on the trail continuously. And since the, the railroad uh, maintenance ended in the 1970s, their maintenance issues have continued to crop up. Okay. And this was um, the, um, 
Specifically, <laughs> some of the trail maintenance issues um, became apparent in the fall of 2017, right? And um, eventually led to this slump that we're talking about. And um, that was eventually, that was, that was taken in the fall of 2017. In 2018, that section of the trail completely gave way and um, necessitating the closure of the trail in that stretch. Okay, which is what led to um, this study. Okay, and one of the main purposes of this study is to document the conditions along the whole trail, not just along the slumped section, in order to inform this community discussion and as a baseline of the natural setting of the trail to recognize changes in the future. I want to point out that's that's um, Evelyn Doolittle. She was one of the three students that helped me on this project. And uh, she did a lot of the work. And uh, there she's looking down the closed section of the trail. And it's been a pleasure working with the students. I'm gonna tell you more about our study at the end. <clears throat> okay, so the, for the purposes of this study, we divided the trail up into eight segments. All right, and each one of those segments has its own character, its own access point, and also its own, um, issues when it comes to maintenance. Okay, mostly we're gonna be talking about the Northern section here. Okay, so this is where we're gonna focus our attention, but of course the study has been about the entire trail to inventory the entire thing. Okay, so this is the, a map of the Northern part of the trail. This is about uh, three tenths of a mile long right here. Here's Bayfield. The, Reroute where Evelyn, where we just saw Evelyn standing was right there. The closed section of the trail is three tenths of a mile long down to Lakeshore Drive. And the reroute takes you up to the roads. It's half a mile long and then it brings you down Lakeshore Drive um, where, the, where it meets up again. Um, mostly we're gonna be talking about this area and some other areas in the North. And then of course, um, looking at the whole thing. So first I wanna talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, the natural setting, okay? Um, and the current conditions along the trail. Okay, so the landscape is gently sloping towards Lake Superior. And then there is a steep bluff along the edge here that has been created by the wave action of Lake Superior. All of this landscape is, of course, the result of the geologic history, which in this area um, had a lot of lakes, glacial lakes at the end of glaciation and, and right after glaciation. Lake levels were rising and falling and uh, eroding the landscape, uh, carving it out, and also uh, creating sediments and depositing and redepositing those sediments. <clears throat> Um, underneath those glacial age sediments, there is um, bedrock. Um, and the bedrock here is sandstone, um, solid sandstone. And the thing about the, the bedrock is that it is the depth of bedrock, which is always an important geologic consideration. The depth of bedrock uh, is different, differs greatly from place to place. Okay, this is just after the closed section. This is, this is a photograph from 1976, uh, aerial photograph. And in that time, at that time, there were not as many trees along the shoreline and you could really see where the rock uh, sticks out. Okay, that's an important consideration. Um, the Southern part of the trail, south of the closed section, there's a lot of rock and that uh, stabilizes the shoreline a lot more than does the softer sediments to the North. So that's an important consideration. And the, the depth to rock, as I mentioned, is like from zero right at the surface to more than 100 feet in some places, depth to rock. Okay, the geologic materials at the site, the, the surface materials is mostly sandy. Okay, so these are sandy shoreline sediments, it's a mix of things, but it's predominantly sandy sediments. There's a little bit of silt in there and also a little bit of clay, okay, but predominantly sandy and um, that's the surface geologic materials. But in some places we did find clay, some solid clay like this. And there is more clay, some, some drilling um, determined that there is more clay at depth. 
And we're interested in that because the surface materials, the surface geologic materials influence how water moves across the land, moves into the land. So that's something we're always interested in. And clay, of course, is quite impermeable. Okay. These are the, the soils, okay, and soils map of the area showing the brownstone trail. And as you can see, a lot of different soil types in there. Okay, so it's a mix of things and the soils are the result of the original geologic material and the history since then. I know there's a lot of detail there, but what matters is that um, the trail, the material surrounding the trail is quite variable. So that um, influences, it makes the conditions in different places um, different variable. What we're interested in always is we're interested in the way water interacts with the geologic materials. That's always an important question. What happens to a drop of water when it falls from the sky? Okay, how does it get, how does it leave the land? Does it infiltrate? If it's sandy sediments, is it clay? Does it run off? And uh, what happens to it as it runs off? Those are important questions always. So we, of course, were interested in the hydrologic features of along the, along the trail. And this is a map, this is our map showing the whole trail and the hydrologic features. There aren't a lot, there, there, there aren't any really large drainage basins, okay? But there are a lot of small rivers that flow right into Lake Superior. And at each one of them, the water flows under the trail, under the railroad, the old railroad bed in a culvert. Okay, the 22 culverts along the trail, and, and some of those are the shallow surface culverts that I'll show you, but um, these culverts are very important places in any landscape because what happens at a culvert is that the water gets funneled. Okay, so we have to pay attention to what's going on there and also the condition of the culverts. Okay. Yeah, this is this is a typical one. Actually, this is two of them. Okay, this is um, in the south. This is along Shawamigan Road, and we took a look at all of the culverts and saw what kind of condition they they are. Um, yeah, so that's a good one. All right, all right. The vegetation along the trail it's mostly trees, mostly forested. It's a mixed hardwood forest in the south uh, with mixed age. There's a lot of oak. Uh, there's a lot of maple and aspen and also pine. Um, there is one stretch in the middle of the trail that has a significant, significant amount of um, buckthorn, an invasive species. Okay, we didn't see that in the north though. In the north, okay, this is the northern section. This is um, one of the maps that we made. This is the vegetation along the northern section and it's more complicated, the vegetation types in the north, right? And there's a lot of detail here, but um, What's different in the north is that there's a lot of box elder. Okay, box elder trees are an indication of recent disturbance. And um, there's some planted sumac uh, along the trail. And there is, uh, there's some areas of non-woody vegetation as well. There's some invasive, invasive species, um, tansy being quite abundant in some places. Okay, we'll come back to that as well. Next, I want to talk about the challenges, okay, and how the setting relates to the challenges that we face, okay? And of course, the challenges with land use always have to do a lot with what the geologic materials are and what the land use history is. And in this case, the railroad is, plays an important role. As I mentioned, we're going to mostly be talking about uh, the northern section here, since that's where our primary areas of concern are. Okay, this is a very important photograph for us to consider. This historic photograph was taken in 1918. Okay, this is South Fifth Street over here. Um, these two houses are still present. Okay, so this was 1918, 104 years ago. And you can see the railroad right there. And you can see how the railroad was created, the railroad bed was created by carving into the old slope. Okay, and what that did was it changed the slope of below and above, and it also changed the way water moves across the landscape. All right, so those, that's an important, important thought. So from 1918, right? 
Okay, this is our, I gotta, I gotta mention Evelyn here. She, she did a great job mapping the surface materials. This is our surface materials map. Again, there's a lot, a lot of detail here that we don't need to uh, go into right now. But um, the main thing to point out is that the pink, our pink unit there is disturbed land. Okay, so the, as we mentioned, the slopes have changed and the hydrology, the way water moves has changed. I'm also gonna talk about some of these areas later, the, the riprap, the rock that's on the slope. Okay, so we took a careful look at the trail profiles. Um, in the north, it's this cut and fill bench. Then we have places where it's elevated. So the railroad was going over a low spot and, and the land was elevated up. There are a few places um, in the central part of the part of the trail where the trail is actually cut down into the landscape. And then much of it is at grade, right? And each of these has its own uh, different challenges. Hang on, okay. And in the cut and fill bench, uh, what we have is issues with slumping and that's mostly what we're talking about tonight, okay? In the elevated sections where the railroad grade actually creates a dam, the water has to go underneath in a culvert, okay? So in those places, we have to pay attention to the culvert. In the few sections where the trail is cut into the landscape, there's the possibility of ponding, okay? And there is a little bit of an issue with that in one place, but much of the trail is actually um, at grade, which has minimal issues, okay? All right, um, talking about the cut and fill bench here. Okay, here's the original slope as we as we saw, right? And then what happens is when it gets over steepened, I mean, when to get the cut and fill, it gets over steepened, and then this is the place that is susceptible to, to slumping. Okay, the other thing is, uh, let me go back to this one. Some of the fill fill was not the native material. Okay, a lot of it was the native material right there, but we also found quite a bit of this which is cinders, okay? Cinders from coal fires, probably from the locomotives and the, you know, whatever they were burning coal in, lots of coal was burned in those days. And um, the cinders don't pack very well. So it isn't the most solid of, um, of fill materials, okay? Which leads us to thinking about the stability of slopes, okay? And what makes a stable slope? All right, it is, quite widely recognized that a ratio of three to one, three times wider than tall, or an 18 degree slope is in most materials, a stable slope, okay? By the time we get to a one to one ratio or a 45 degree slope, that is almost certainly unstable. And so what is a stable slope in here between you know, 18 and 45 degrees? There are a lot of variables that control that, right? And it's the geologic materials, it's what's happening on the slope vegetation, so there isn't a single number. <laughs> Unfortunately, there isn't a single magic number that we're shooting for. But um, nevertheless, these are important numbers for us to keep in mind, okay? 18 degrees being stable, 26 and eh, maybe stable, right? And then 45, certainly unstable. So what we did is we measured a lot of these slopes and we just stretched out a tape measure to measure the length of the slope and we used this angle um, angle meter to measure the slopes. In some places we use a little bit different technique, but basically just measuring lots of slopes and um, to see what we found. And this is, this, is, uh, the, this is a graph showing 76 places where about 100 feet long, each one of them, where we measured the slope, okay? And what we see is a lot of the slopes are 30 to 35 degrees. Some of them, a lot of them up to 40 degrees. Right, and even some 45, even, even higher. So we're talking about slopes that are maybe stable, okay, and some that um, are unlikely to be stable just because of their, their steepness, okay. And then also um, that we generated this map from uh, publicly available LIDAR uh, information. And this shows much the same thing, but it shows the distribution of the steep slopes and you can see this is the section that we're, that we're talking about primarily, and you can see that the whole thing is really pretty steep, right? So we're talking 40, 40 degree slopes in many of those places. This is a typical cross section, 
right, um, of the trail, right, with, you know, 35 degrees. These are measured. This was a measured one um, in the cross set, I mean, in the closed section. 35 degree slope, 41 degree slope below. So some pretty steep slopes. Okay. All right, so there are many things that influence um, shorelines, that influence slopes and shoreline and bluff erosion. Okay, some of these are natural processes. So shoreline erosion is a natural process that's been going on long before the trail was there, but then also humans do things that exacerbate those, those issues, mostly having to do with the steepness of the slope and the way that the water, and the way the water moves over the slope, okay? Um, one of the factors that, that contributes to this is shoreline erosion. So there are really three things that we're talking about. One is the slopes, the steep slope. Another is the erosion at the bottom of the slope. And the third thing is the flow of the water. So those are the things that we really need to pay attention to, right? And this shows, this is a photograph right um, in the closed section where you can see that the waves have been undercutting, the trees are falling in, and that's one of the issues there. And this, this is interesting because the, the lake level of Lake Superior has fluctuated greatly in the last 20 years. And a changing lake level is, is um, one of the things that accelerates shoreline erosion, okay, a changing lake level. And then also it was unusually high. It was near record high in 2019, about the time that this, this was, the slumps were really getting to be active. And we had um, some, some large storms, okay, and large runoff events. And as the climate changes, we can probably, um, we'll probably be seeing more of these severe storms and high waves. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind in terms of long-term stability as well. Okay, so um, this is the other thing. And this is a little diagram that shows the erosion at the base of the slope. It's called the toe of the slope. So we've got shoreline erosion down here. Okay, we've got steep slopes. And then we've got water coming over the land. And then in some cases, infiltrating as groundwater and soil water and moving underneath the trail. So those are all the things we want to think about, okay? This is one of the small surface culverts. <clears throat> okay, um, there, are, there are about a dozen of these that get water from one side of the trail to the other without causing a lot of surface erosion along there. Okay, so one of the things we're interested in is not just the hydrology right along the trail itself, but we're also interested in what's going on in the landscape above the trail because that's where much of the water is coming from. And is it coming off of parking lots and roads where it can run off really fast? Is it being funneled by culverts? Those are things that we need to pay attention to. And we have all of those as factors, okay. Okay, and then there is vegetation as well. It is definitely true <clears throat> that vegetation influences slope stability and that slope stability influences the vegetation. There's no doubt that's true. In our study, we didn't see a strong correlation between the type of vegetation and slope stability. So that in this place isn't one of the, the major factors, but it's definitely true that any kind of disturbance on a slope is something that it can destabilize. So the cutting of vegetation probably is something that um, is, has contributed to some of the instability. Okay. All right, um, so that's the general setting. What I wanna do is I wanna talk about um, three areas in particular, the slump area, um, an area at the beginning of the closed section, and then one closer to town. So we're gonna um, talk about those. These are the three main areas of concern. This one, the slump area, is really our primary area of concern and um, one of the reasons why we're talking tonight. Okay. Okay, this is a cross section. We measured these. This is, this is all from measurements taken in the field. Um, this is a cross section at the slump area. And you can see the uh, cutting of the toe of the slope. You can see where this is where the trail used to be, okay? And then what happened in 2018 is when this gave way. 
right? What's important to note here is that there just isn't a lot of space, okay? So we've got a retaining wall above and the shoreline below and some really steep slopes in between, all right? So what happened in, after that first slide, I'll show you 2017, 2018, this is the trail before, okay? This is the same stretch. And this is after that slump in 2018, the major slump, there's Evelyn standing there for scale. All right, so it's about a 20 foot stretch of trail that is no longer, no longer there, All right? And uh, here's a close up view of it, right? The trail uh, was right in here, okay? <clears throat> And if you take a look in the close up there, you can actually see some water seeping out where the slump took place. Okay, so water could have been not only erosion at the toe of the slope, but also ero or, uh, water saturated under the trail could have also been a contributing factor. Okay, so again, I just, and then of course, water, how the water leaves that site. <clears throat> what I wanna point out here is just that there's just not a lot of room for the trail, okay? Because it's just so steep right now. That's one more view uh, looking to the south and you can see uh, where the slump place right there. Okay, um, now we'll go north to the, I wanna point out that this, the closed section is about three tenths of a mile long and the total that we're talking about here that is unstable is about a 300 foot stretch in there where there just isn't a lot of room and there are unstable slopes. Okay, so South 7th Street comes down here. There's a culvert right at the end, right? And that culvert dumps the water right in there, right above the trail. Okay, so there's water actually flowing over the trail in some places right here. And there is actually some surface erosion taking place on the trail. Okay, so that's an issue from above. But then we also, we poked around in here and this dotted yellow line I have there shows um, something, a crack that has opened up right here. It's about a two foot crack, okay? And the land is starting to slump down. It's about a hundred feet long there. And um, this is similar to what the land looked like before the 2018 slump, okay? So this is an, this is an area of concern. I mean, this trail is stable for now, but it is something we need to keep an eye on. And then further down the slope, there is, there's some real wet, there's a real wet spot, okay? So um, the drainage there is an issue. And all, we also found quite a bit of the solid clay right there. So there, there certainly are uh, issues of the water getting out of that slope. Okay, that's the South 7th Street. Now we'll take one more look um, on an area of concern here at South 5th Street. Okay, this is city owned. And here's South Fifth, South Fifth Street that comes down. And it's a similar kind of situation where we have drainage coming off of the street. And then it, in this case, there isn't a culvert. It just comes right down this steep slope. And um, it was 2005, the next photograph from 2005 that Erica shared with me when there was a big, a big like slump that came down from above onto the trail. Okay, so then it basically buried the trail. And then that was 2005, some stone was placed on the trail there to try to stabilize it some. Um, there have been some issues since then, since 2005. Okay, so that's another area that we need to be, we need to be thinking about. Okay, um, yeah, so this shows um, in the north, in the far northern part of the trail, um, there's a boat yard, okay? So the lake is not impinging on the toe of the slope, okay? So, but we do have issues with drainage from above. So in some places we have issues from above and some places from below, all right? So we need to keep an eye on that. Okay, now I just wanna go back um, to this, this <laughs> Evelyn's great map of the surface materials of the Brownstone Trail and um, just some general thoughts about slope stability here. Uh, what I wanna mention is riprap, okay? And these areas shown in sort of the dotted, there are a lot of these areas here, not really big, but many of them where rock has been placed on the slope. Riprap is what it's called, all right? And this is, um, this is a typical riprap on the slope and it's laid there to, to um, anchor the slope and it, it does in some cases work, but it also creates other issues as well. One of which is vegetation really has a hard time coming up through it. And so um, that can create issues as well. 
right? What we saw in the riprap was that there are a variety of rock types, okay? So this is quartzite, that's quartzite riprap. And also multiple generations of uh, riprap have been laid um, adjacent to the trail. Okay, so what this means is that the, the maintenance of the trail by the railroad company was ongoing, right? And they brought rock in and they brought rock in from a lot of different places, a lot of different times. And um, that tells the story of, the, of how the slopes were managed in the past. Okay, this is, like I said, this is quartzite. Interesting, that quartzite is almost certainly from Southern Wisconsin brought in on the railroad. This is a local piece of concrete, okay, um, dumped right there. So you can see, I mean, two, at least two generations of, of riprap being placed on that slope. Okay, the story of um, stability or um, intermittent stability <laughs> and intermittent um, instability is also told by the trees, all right? And the, the trunks of the trees, if the slope is unstable and it's slumping, the tree's trunk will be rotated down, but then it will start to grow vertically. And this is an interesting one because this is an old dead white pine that slumped a long time ago and then grew straight and then was stable at least until the tree died. Okay, so that's telling a similar story of intermittent instability and, um, and then, you know, the trees adjusting and humans adjusting. Okay. So that brings us back to this uh, photograph from 1918 um, that we have to keep in mind about what, what, we're, what we're dealing with here. Uh, we have issues from above and from below and, and um, from vegetation, okay? <clears throat> right. So uh, most of our concerns are in the north, okay? But as I mentioned, we, uh, we did this study to see what the condition of the whole trail is. So we also have to take a look at what we have found in the Southern part of the trail, okay? And let me go back to this one. All right, so here's the end of the closed section. Right after, right south of the end of the closed section is where the bedrock begins, okay? So this photograph right here, I showed you before, this, the closed section is right about in there, okay? And this is the beginning of the bedrock. And you can see that the shoreline has, has got a lot of rock. Much of the Southern part of the trail has got rock as the shoreline, which is much more stable. And the trail is further in. It's, it's not right along the shoreline for much of, so much of it. So it doesn't have the, many of the issues that it does in the north because of the rock and because it's not adjacent. It's not on really steep land. You know, it's, it's most of it, as I mentioned, is at grade. Okay. So either at grade or it's um, an elevated section. And so the, the biggest concern in the south is not the stability above or below, but the culverts that take the water underneath the trail. And the condition of the culvert is something that we need to pay attention to. Okay, um, most of them are in good shape, um, fortunately, and um, we did a complete culvert inventory. And um, but there are a few. This is the worst one. This is under Shawamigan Road. Okay, there are a few that um, are in bad shape. And this is an issue because if the water can get under the culvert, it can actually erode underneath the culvert and remove material and that destabilizes the whole thing. Okay, so there are several issues that can happen with culverts um, and, and including being undercut, they can also get clogged up and water can flow over the top and erode the, the road. So those are things we need to be aware of. Okay, so some final thoughts here. All right. Um, much of the southern part of the trail is in good shape. Um, we, our primary areas of concern are in the section that is now closed, okay? A 300 foot stretch in here that is particularly where the slump took place, where we really need to focus our attention. And in that closed section and end at um, the end of South 7th Street, the issue is, what we mentioned, and that is that there just isn't a lot of room, okay? It's a steep slope that was, you know, that was the railroad grade and it is being undercut by the waves of Lake Superior underneath. South of that, 
not really an issue, right? And north of that, we have the boat yard, which protects the, you know, so the so it isn't being undercut right at the bottom of the slope. In that area, what we have is we have drainage issues from above. Okay, so those are those are the primary areas of concern um, that we found. Okay. And so uh, dealing with this, as Erica mentioned, is, you know, there are a lot of different landowners and a lot of stakeholders here. Okay, we have um, many landowners as well as the town of Bayfield, the city of Bayfield, trail supporters, business, businesses, donors, and landmark conservancy. So it's going to take a coordinated effort to keep this trail maintained. Okay, and keep in mind, one of the things we want to do is it's not just about the trail, it's also about the habitat and um, preserving the land and, the, and um, the conservation value of the land as well. Okay, so there it is, community asset that we are all interested in. So thank you for participating. I wanna tell you a little bit about this study. Okay, um, get this out of my way a little bit. Okay, um, I wanna thank my three students. It was great to work with these three. Okay, Evelyn Doolittle, she was the master mapper. Okay, <laughs> great work, Evelyn. And uh, uh, Danny Gentile, who was the slope master, he <laughs> measured a lot of slopes for us. Thank you, Danny. And then Eli Mangan, who uh, was the GIS expert and made all the maps in the lab. Thank you to you three. And then also we have the, uh, the funding from the Duluth Superior Community Foundation, which paid the students salaries for the summer and um, some of the expenses. And then I also wanna thank uh, my colleagues, my faculty and staff colleagues at Northland College for their time and effort in this as well. I wanna tell you about um, what was coming from this project. Okay, this presentation is the first thing, the first time we've presented this information. Okay, and this is being recorded and it is obviously going to be available um, through Landmark's webpage. And then um, we're going to do a brief version of this, like the five minute version for people who don't wanna listen to the whole thing. Okay, so that will be available also through Landmark. And then we're gonna have the complete document. So this is gonna, we're, we're working on a big document that's gonna be um, all of the details. We, there's a lot more that we studied um, that is not been presented tonight. That is just good background information for future reference. Um, it's all going to be available in print format and digital format um, by Landmark. And then also a brief written document that's going to be uh, available through Landmark and also sent to landowners. There are 57 landowners along the trail and um, that we sent a survey out to and we're going to be sending them and anyone who wants it. Uh, if you have questions, comments, we'd be glad to to talk with you about this, here's my, someplace under here is my email address, Tom Fitz, tfitz at northland.edu. And I'm sure that Erica at Landmark would also be glad to talk with you about it. Okay, and that, and with that, I will maybe <laughs> stop sharing and turn it over to Erica, who's going to introduce Chris, and if you have questions from my part, well, I'll be back and we can we can talk about it all later as well. Okay, and like I said, feel free to contact me. Great job, Tom. Great job. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to just turn it over to Chris. So Chris um, is just going to take a few minutes from Smith Group and just walk us through as a community how typical, uh, how we typically look at these things as a community and what framework uh, we use to then arrive at some potential solutions. Go Thank ahead, you, Erica. Your screen. So as Erica mentioned, I'm just briefly here going to walk through um, some of the things that we're working with Landmark to look at for an additional little bit of additional data gathering and then to inform com some long term stability strategies for the bluff and trail. Um, primarily focused on those areas of concern that Tom was talking about. Uh, as an overall background, we're just going to walk really quickly through what we've done in the previous study with Landmark around the slump area, but then to talk quickly about what else we're looking to find out to better inform some decision making around uh, those areas of concern and what potential strategies can be used to provide some long term stability, but as well as what, what short term management options and what management strategies for that whole trail section might exist. So over since 2019. 
Um, Smith Group has been working with Landmark on a, a number of studies around the existing soil conditions, the watershed and drainage areas to understand how much of that rainfall and stormwater flows are coming down towards this trail section. We've been working with geotechnical engineers and doing soil borings out on the uh, existing slump site to understand what the slope is made up of and how the slope is responding to the over steepening at the toe from that wave action that Tom was talking about, as well as how the upper portions of the slope um, have been re reacting and, and responding to the stormwater flows um, that have been coming over land. From the Lakeside Smith Group, it's been doing a bunch of analysis to understand um, statistical water levels of Lake Superior and how that affects uh, the erosion of the toe and what types and potential conditions of waves, heights, um, might be occurring at the, the toe segment to uh, understand how high up that toe erosion is being caused by these variations in lake levels over time. Moving forward, we're working with land with Landmark um, to, to identify a couple small, very strategic additional data gathering and analyses um, to support understanding this long-term um, resilient bluff uh, strategy. Um, to really understand better what the topographic area, um, what the heights and slopes of the existing bluff are, and then from a nearshore perspective, what the, the uh, lake bottom depths or the hydrographic depths of the lake are. Um, this will inform quite a bit, as well as looking at some um, localized upland runoff and stormwater analyses. And the topographic data will also help identify if there are areas that we might be looking at doing some additional um, soil information, soil boring, stability analysis to look at what those slope factors are and what that stability safety factor is um, to ensure that the uh, trail is um, a, a safe space to, to recreate. From the topographic and bathymetric uh, survey standpoint, this orange area indicates kind of the near shore area we'd like to survey to really understand um, how deep the shoreline is in there, how deep the near shore water depths of the lake are. This supports understanding how big the waves at the shoreline can be at various lake levels. Um, and it additionally informs kind of, well the feasibility and the cost associated with doing different types of toe protection that we'll talk about briefly in a little bit. From the topo standpoint, you can see in this purple shaded area, um, we're really looking to understand the existing bluff slopes. Tom did a great job of utilizing existing information to understand what some of the existing steepness is. Uh, but what we'd also like to do is get an up-to-date present understanding of where the high points are, where the low points are, what the grade of the trail is, um, where that toe sits in relation to the lake to uh, really look at what the, the stability factor along this stretch is um, and where there are areas that we might see over steep end that weren't picked up in historic uh, topographic data. Um, and then this also, this topo data also feeds into understanding kind of those drainage patterns. Tom was, was talking about um, how that water from uphill is moving towards the lake. And so as you can see here, what we utilize that topo data to do is understand from a watershed perspective, you've got a bunch of sheet flow and some culvert flow coming down towards the lake. And where are those high points and where are the drainage patterns driving and concentration of flow? And how does that relate to the existing stormwater culverts or infrastructures or outlets? And is the volume of that material of that water coming downhill overwhelming it? Is it causing um, other problems? And is there a better way that might be implemented to manage that flow so that the erosion is minimized. Using this additional information, we can update kind of what we understand about the existing cross-section perspective of the, the existing bluff, where we've got the multitude of property ownerships that, we're that we've been talking about, as well as the limited space that Landmark has to work within, some of it being easements, some of it being um, ownership. And being able to utilize that, we can understand what might happen in the future with other locations that has uh, been studied at the slump site and understanding when we have failure, where does the slope want to go based on that soil boring with soil type of type information. Finally, I mean, ultimately, this is all about the long term stability of the, of the trail and the bluff and keeping the recreational value in place. Uh, so utilizing this information, Landmark and Smith Group are, are looking at a slew of 
um, long-term strategies for everything from that stormwater management using things such as infrastructure or green infrastructure items further upslope. Are there opportunities for using um, a combination of uh, more hard infrastructure, but with a green overlay for things like GeoWeb that allow for steeper slopes, but vegetated at the same time? Are there uh, tow protection strategies that can provide habitat value, um, such as cobble berms or revetments done in a um, informed and uh, thoughtful way? Um, and then also what slopes will we be looking at if we really do want to restore just a, a, a natural vegetated slope? Uh, also looking at some short-term management strategies uh, for different areas that might be valuable to understand as a steward of the of the trail itself, um, the use of continued use of riprap for short term management. Um, are there areas that slopes could be vegetated uh, if we don't have those pinch points Tom was talking about? And then um, always understanding uh, how trail setbacks and realignment might affect use and things of that nature. Ultimately, really, what we're looking to do here is develop strategies that address slope stability issues while providing that recreational and habitat values. And that's all I've got for you guys tonight. Uh, I'll hand it back over to Erica. Thanks, Chris, for providing that framework and how we can look at these things. Um, now I'm going to just ask Lindsay Ketchell. She, uh, she's our executive director here at Landmark Conservancy. She's going to just share some next steps and then also um, just also try to help us close and then we'll move on to the question and answers too. Hi everybody, Lindsay Ketchell, Executive Director of Landmark Conservancy. And again, thank you so much for taking your time this afternoon uh, for joining us with this presentation. And I also just have to tell you how warm and exciting it is to engage and involve students in helping us analyze and evaluate and move um, solutions forward. As you can imagine, this next generation of conservation leaders in their 18, 19, 20 year olds, they're our future land protections and to allowing them to work with us and partner with us to analyze this site. Um, I just can't say enough and I'm just so grateful for Tom's leadership um, in helping all this happen. Now, I do wanna point out for next steps, I do think it was fairly obvious in one of the slides, how narrow Landmark's actual ownership is of the trail um, that was donated to us by Mary Rice. And when we first looked at this issue, um, our initial idea was, made, boy, let's see if we can just fix the trail right at the trail and, and move forward. Um, but as it became very obvious after we brought in some really important folks like Smith Group and others, we don't see a solution without acquiring the property upslope. Um, and that would be the Mackey property. Uh, it will allow us to get in the equipment in that we need. We can't even get the equipment in. And it will allow us, I think, to get to a grade and a location of the trail where its, its shelf life will be much longer than it currently is. So my organization is in uh, negotiations um, we, with Mackey. I can share with you that we have a shared framework of moving forward. So I'm very, very encouraged that Landmark will be able to help this community collaboratively work forward in maintaining and keeping this trail open. And so our commitment right now is focusing in on moving forward with that acquisition. And we'll be sure to share with many of you as we move forward, uh, probably more likely in March or maybe April, an opportunity for the community to make donations to support this acquisition. Uh, my organization can't do this alone. Uh, we do not have a million dollar land fund <laughs> sitting somewhere. When we do land projects, it's the community and a collaborative effort moving forward. And so we're encouraged. We're hearing loud and clear from the community to move forward with this trail. And we look forward to that partnership with everyone. We're also going to create a very interactive uh, community design opportunity for the slump area. Once we're able to collectively acquire that property, we really want to turn this into a community space. And that's for you to help and lead the design of what that would look like and what the community really needs and wants out of that space. Um, I will tell you, though, that um, if you can imagine or, 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 or appreciate the fact that 
uh, the Mackey family, um, given COVID and some of the challenges, have asked us for a fairly long-term uh, lease back to them uh, so that they can reimagine their new businesses. Um, and it's kind of a difficult time to acquire materials. Um, so we're going to make this, uh, let, let the Mackey family have a nice uh, quality time as they shift their locations um, through that process. But it will also allow us to get working on the trail ASAP. So if you still see some Mackey activity, don't worry, we'll be working on the trail side with everyone's help. Um, and then you'll hear about the restoration fundraising plan. We anticipate probably coming out in the fall more uh, or have a stronger sense and understanding of the detailed cost associated with those restorations. Um, but I can tell you, I feel very encouraged that there are additional um, uh, grant funding sources um, and besides the community that we'll be tapping into to move that forward um, and then address other areas of concern. And, and you know, we want to front load this as soon as possible with the village and the town and all the other key players to ensure. And I already saw in the chat, I think it was one homeowner who was had their house positioned in one of the photographs and wanted to know, well, what can we do now to be preventive? And that's exactly what we want to try to do. Work collaboratively with all the partners to be as preventative as we can moving forward. And obviously this is going to take a significant community engagement in order to get this over the finish line. So we're going to really uh, ask and expect and hope for lots of volunteers, lots of helpers, Lots of people were willing to step up and step up and step in and uh, for the trail and for uh, restoration and, and great outdoor recreation. And I also have to say, this is also an important part of your economic development. And we very much realize outdoor recreation is why people come to Bayfield. It's what they love. And you long-term or seasonal residents get to enjoy it all the time. And we certainly want nothing better than to get you back on the trail. I also want wanted to share with you that we are always open to and looking for uh, what we call bridge funders. If you can imagine with the acquisition of the Mackey property and some of the other efforts we've got going on, um, having a little bit more reserve in our organization for this project um, is something we'll probably we will be seeking out. We did this very similarly with the America Berkebeiner Ski Foundation. We just recently acquired an amazing property associated with that trail. But we were very delighted to have a community family step up and provide us with a bridge loan so that we at Landmark don't have to get into our, our, our operating reserves and, and, and things of that nature. Um, so if anybody has would like to know a little bit more information about that or what that might look like, feel free to contact myself or Kristen um, for more information. Um, again, thank you so much. And I think we're at the Q&A. My name is Sarah Norman. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator. Um, we have only had one question come in through the chat um, as of now, and that was the one that Lindsay had mentioned. Um, and uh, Stuart Allison had said that he owns a house at the end of South Fifth. Uh, things look a bit better today than in 1918, uh, but I do have a lot of concerns about stabilizing the slope between my house and the trail. Will there be recommendations about how to take better care of the slope? As Lindsay mentioned, um, obviously the landmark doesn't own much land along the trail. So I think in Stewart's case, the more we can put folks in touch with technical experts, so Bayfield County Land and Water Conservation Department has really good information about rain gardens, culverts, vegetation management. I think, Stuart, in your location, I think what we really need to figure out is how to solve the city property slump, um, because what's happening is that slump just continues to march down the trail. So not only is it failing at the face, it's also cutting into the edges and failing at the sides too, if that makes any sense. And I know a lot of folks are familiar with that particular location. Um, Kate Kitchell and I have had some conversations about that in terms of, of really trying to route that water underground, under the trail, 
and then out to the lake, um, you know, closer to the lake bottom, I think that would really help. Um, snow management, you know, doing snow management differently rather than loading all that snow at the end of South Fifth will also help. So absolutely, there's definitely some things, um, I think some real cookie cutter solutions for some areas of the trail, and then other ones that we're going to have to dive a little bit deeper and look further upslope to figure out those solutions. But I don't see Landmark obviously paying for all of those, um, uh, as Lindsay mentioned, but I think that we could definitely uh, point folks in the right uh, direction and help with technical assistance for sure. Thank you, Erica. Um, how soon do uh, we expect to need manual labor, volunteers to work on the trail? So we've been routing all of our projects really now through the Bayfield Area Trails Group, recognizing that this trail is part of that network. Um, it's been a very thoughtful um, way, I think, that we've been going about it. And so while Landmark can help announce trail events and announce volunteer days, we've really been trying to do the signups and everything through the Bayfield Area Trails Group. So if folks want to sign up for those updates, um, Kate Kitchell and others have been doing a fantastic job calling out when we do need volunteers and when there's a work day. Um, and we will, we sort of do it as needed, if you will. Um, I'm trying to think about what, what's kind of gravel is sort of always needed. Uh, that will probably be on the list for this spring. Um, and when, then we obviously did a large stair repair at the Blue Wing Bay section too recently. So go to that website and sign up and then you'll get all of the information sent to you as to when uh, they're going to organize an event. Thank you, Erica. Okay, I think this one's a really important one, something that uh, that we should distinguish here. Um, somebody said, you mentioned that Landmark is leasing the trail from property owners. How might this change with the sale of properties and prevent more detours of the original trail? Yeah, so it, was, sorry, it is not a lease, it's an actual trail easement. Um, most of the trail easements are permanent, which means that they are perpetual. They are recorded with the title of the land and it doesn't matter who comes, you know, after 500 years from now, <laughs> doesn't matter which owner. However, I will mention that there are a few that are, there's at least two that come to mind that are a five-year lease and there's one that's a 10-year. And here at Landmark, our goal would really be trying to work with those property owners to get a perpetual trail easement. As you can imagine, there's quite a bit of tracking that goes into, uh, you know, five year or 10 year um, trail easement agreements. And then also we always run the risk if the property does change hands and the next person isn't as supportive of the trail, they could shut the trail down in that location. Um, so it's definitely something that's on our mind. There's just a few out there that are not permanent. I believe there are three or four. And so that is something that we're always working toward. Thank you. We have some good comments in here. Um, Kate Kitchell had mentioned um, that uh, people interested in volunteering can sign up to the Bayfield Area Trails website. She dropped it in the comments here. Awesome. Did you see the Ted and Tracy question? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, Ted and Tracy, this is great background information and good to see the research work by Tom and his students and the work with the Smith Group. What's the next step for the community and where can we get engaged in financial or hands-on ways? Is there any sort of timeline on this? Lindsay, you want to talk about that? I'll punch yeah, you. I will. Yeah, and I tried to mention it ever so briefly. Um, and we will be getting more formal written documents out to folks. Um, really, what are the next steps for the community? Uh, one is, as I mentioned earlier, we will be quietly seeking um, some bridge lender or donations or pledges to help us move forward with securing the acquisition. Um, additionally, I anticipate our advancement director, Kristen, in about in March or April, we will do more a formal, what I would describe as a formal fundraising campaign for that acquisition with a hope of closing sometime in mid-August. Um, and then the hands-on ways, what we're going to try to do 
is uh, not try to do. In the agreement, we will be leasing back to Mackey, but we will have access to the trail section, the back end of his property, of the property. And we anticipate that there may be some opportunities for some um, hands-on ways of involving. But at this point in time, I, my, I anticipate that more of that hands-on way may be more linked to uh, getting a hold of um, Kate Kitchell and their group. Because mm -hmm. I have a feeling it's going to take us a little while before we're ready to have too many sho community shovels going on in that spot. We're going to have to prep it a little bit. And then one of the other things that I'm also deeply uh, committed to, but uh, again, it's going to take a village to see if maybe we can come up with a better reroute also. Because um, I do know that in the past I have gotten a couple of complaints regarding the reroute. So maybe with that acquisition, we may be able to make it a little bit more pleasant for folks in the interim. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, are there ways to reduce the snow loading upslope from the slump? Um, well, the snow loading is really uh, the biggest issue with the snow loading is that in the south fifth. Uh, Mackie is not so much of an issue. They have they moved their snow around. Um, it doesn't all go right at the slump, and it's probably a very minor factor. And Chris, you can chime in versus all the other things that are going on at that particular slump site. Um, but South Fifth, um, that would probably be working with the city and the public works department to figure out how they can do that a little bit differently. Um, South Fifth is a challenging site. Um, there's a lot of water that is moving from further upland and actually also over city streets that ends up all at the end of South Fish, Fifth and then cascades either over the slope or it's being saturated into um that slope and then you know basically weighing down that bank so i think it is a, a, a working with the city i know the city is looking into more green infrastructure um kate if you're on if you want to talk about that a little bit um and thinking about culverts and what's working well and what's not working well thank you erica um Lindsay, somebody thought that maybe the lease mentioned earlier was referring to the Mackey family leasing back the use of their former land. Could mm -hmm. you uh, talk about that a little bit? Yep, just that part of the uh, negotiations we've been having with, with Mark and Dan, which have they've been wonderful to work with. We've been very, very fortunate that we both recognize that we both have to be a part of, we're both part of the community solution here. Um, and so when, when we originally had these dis discussions with Mackey, uh, they were considering moving and relocating in a couple of years. But as a result of COVID, um, inflation, difficulty accessing materials, um, and, hit, and their unclearness of what their future business model will be, we are going to look at a more like a four or five year leasing release back to them. So you will still see them. They will still be at the location, um, but we will be the owners of the property if all goes moving forward. Um, I do want to though point out that Rick Remington, my conservation director is on the call and he will remind all of us that nothing is finished until everything is signed. So while I'm saying we're negotiating in good faith and we've got a great framework and I'm very encouraged, I want to be very clear, I do not have a signed purchase and sales agreement. So um, things can always happen in negotiations, um, but we know how important this project is to the community. I think we're trying to step up a little bit and help you all have a better insight on how things are going. Thank you. Um, with the acquisition of the additional uh, uphill land from the slump, so the potential acquisition of the Mackey property, uh, is there space to shift the trail location a little farther from the water if the cost savings would be large? We will definitely be taking that trail and it's not going to go where it is now. <laughs> and Chris, you can chime in on this. As stable as we're going to try to make that slope, uh, it's never, it's not ever going to be quite the same. Um, so yes, we will be definitely pulling the trail back. It will be high, high up. There'll be a really nice view. 
I think we need to still give some thoughts as to how we get up the slope because I know folks don't want a huge grade. They don't want a lot of elevation change. And so all that still needs to be worked out. Um, but I think the restoration and stabilization, you know, they'll definitely, that'll be, I think, more thought through with experts. And uh, I think there's only going to be a few things that we can do on the slope itself. And then I think where we'll really want community input is uh, on the community space, you know, the Mackey property that will become this community space and this more natural space. What do folks want to see there? You know, a parking area, a picnic shelter, um, you know, electric car charger, uh, bike rack, you know, what, what does that look like? Um, the goal is to turn it into a more natural space that's very much in line with Landmark Conservancy's mission. Um, some folks have asked us, you know, can we put up a hotel? Can we put up senior living? Um, that site, even with all the work we're gonna do, is not a very large site. Uh, it has stability issues in, in general, um, in terms of being able to really hold a three-story building or something like that. There's another whole retaining wall on the north side that is more stable that will stay there. Um, so it is a little bit of a complicated site. Yeah. Um, but yes, the trail will definitely be away from the lake. Whether or not we'll have access down to the lake, we have to think through that still. Yeah. And I do want to jump in real quick. I saw a, a, a quick question from Ted and Tracy, and I just want to, it was directed towards Chris, but I want to jump in as Lindsay, that our anticipation is to come out to the community with clear plans and fundraising needs, uh, I would say by the end of the summer. Uh, we need to acquire the property before I can start to actually do the plan. You know, I, we're doing the planning too all at the same time. Don't get me wrong. Um, but my hope is, is that by 2022, we'll be able to start doing a little bit of work um, and then 2023 really knock it out of the park. Now, that's me as the ED and I'm very optimistic, but I, you know, I also know we're in the middle of COVID and all these other challenges, but that's kind of the frame. And Erica, does that sound good for you too? Or <laughs> yeah, the big thing, folks, is we will be getting permits. You can't do anything nowadays without permits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Times have changed since the 1970s. Um, and we really want to, you know, we want to do right by the Army Corps and the DNR. And Smith Group will really be helping us walk through that and choosing designs that are permittable. Uh, and I know we mentioned this in the, at the 2020 community meeting too. And just Erica to, to be able to follow up on a couple of those things. I mean, the, the idea of being able to shift back the trail from its current position helps in dealing with the amount of toe protection and where that toe, toe protection goes and what it looks like, um, which affects things as project costs, as well as permittability, um, how much work we would be doing in the lake to manage um, the overall stability and future stability of, of the bluff um, with potential variations of lake levels now and 20 years in the future uh, perspective, um, all play significant factors into uh, timeline. Um, but th the ability to move that trail back and pull it away from uh, the, the immediate shoreline certainly helps in being able to manage the amount of space and the types of uh, improvements to stabilize that, that shoreline and that trail. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, so somebody asked what and where is the Mackey property? So that's the property up slope from where the slump is currently. Um, and it's the property that we are looking at as a solution um, to reroute the trail. Um, there was another question about um, who will be establishing ownership of the Mackey property and gathering the funds. So Erica, do you wanna talk about long-term ownership of that property? Yeah, short term, likely a uh, landmark, obviously, um, but long term, because there are most likely more grants available to municipalities, should they step up to own the property, um, we have started preliminary conversations with the town of Bayfield and also with Bayfield County. Um, just trying to think about who would be the best owner and have the most resources and be able to handle a, commun a future community space. Yeah. And, and, and this is Lindsay. And right now, though, Landmark will be actively fundraising and we will be acquiring the property and will be the owner. Mm -hmm. 
And we're very comfortable serving as an interim owner. If we need to be a long-term owner, that's always an option. And I would say that maybe in the past, Bayfield might have been a little bit more resistant to past land ownerships, but I think Landmark and our structure allows us to acquire a little bit more land and have a little bit more land ownership mm -hmm. under our belt. So I'm, I'm not as worried about that, but I, I do believe that the long-term owner hopefully will be the town of Bayfield. Mm -hmm. If they, if that's where they choose, because we really, at, and we're not going anywhere, we're still going to be here. We just think that, again, that's the best funding mix. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, will the Mackey purchase be contingent on funding for the restoration project being obtained? Yeah, at this point, no, we're moving forward with the acquisition first. Um, and we are, won't be clear, um, uh, how long it will take us to obtain all the funds necessary for the restoration. But what we can tell you quietly is there is enormous interest in this project by some folks in your community with, with some means. So, so far our indications have been very promising. And there are, will be a number of grant opportunities that we will be able to seek out in addition to uh, philanthropic gifts. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. I think we've gotten through the questions. So, um, Erica, do you want to wrap us up? Sure. And I guess I just also want to mention, you know, as Tom pointed out, there are those other areas of concern. And so we definitely want to Tonight, we want to bring that information to you because we don't want, uh, we want to make folks aware that it is, while we're focusing right now on the Mackey property and the current slump, we need to be focusing on those other areas too, because should that South 7th Street area fail, folks won't be able to get to <laughs> the current slump location, if that makes sense. So it really all needs to be in tandem. It needs to be a multi-year effort. Um, and we're, we're just really excited and hopeful to work with the community on that effort and, and all the technical assistance that, that we need to, to be able to address those other areas of concern. Uh, Cause they definitely are out there. They've been there for a while. Um, we've also noticed them and, and Tom has really brought them to light with this study. So thank you. We'll po be posting a presentation on our website um, and you can, you'll be able to go there and listen to the presentation. If you have any other questions or you want to get in touch with us, you can always reach the staff through our land, landmark website, landmarkwi.org. I still am up here in the Bayfield office uh, behind me. I'm in the office tonight. Uh, it is still in the same building across from Captain Spirits uh, and down the hall from Anna's spa. Um, so you can find me here. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tom, so much for your study. Um, yes, thank you, Tom and the students. <laughs> yeah, I know it was a lot, a lot. And then this is a cool picture. If you all remember Grandin Harris, who passed away a number of years, just a few years ago. I remember he took this one day and he thought it looked like the old railroad uh, that was going down, going down the trail in winter. So I thought this was kind of a fitting uh, closing, pro closing photo. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening and stay warm. <laughs>